David, it's good to have you here. I feel like Welcome. this has been a show in the making for a while. It has. It has. And the only appropriate way to do it is in front of a gigantic ABB robot, correct? It doesn't fit in the frame, but I assure you the rest of the gigantic <laughs> robot is just outside the frame. Yes. Yes. That's what we're doing here. We're in Portland, Oregon. Portland, let, Oregon. let me ask this. I know we just had lunch. Where did we have lunch at? What Lardo. 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 We had mortadella sandwiches. So let's say we were having this conversation at uh, at Lardo right now, which we kind of okay. just... I can envision that. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're having beers. It would be a little later in the day. Sure. This is like a post-lunch conversation. But let me pull this up. I was looking at your website before this, and there's a line on there that I have to kick off our conversation with. If we're, if we're having beers and sandwiches at Lardo, when someone says, you know, David, your website says our mission is revolution. Revolution. Yeah, how do you how, how do you describe that to him, right? Because you're you're an, an automation company. You're more than that, but we'll get into more of that. But how do you sure. describe what Loop does? Uh, revolution means that of all of the different types of automation and all the things going on in the world, we're really interested in the cutting edge. Mm. We think there's a lot of stuff that's sitting around that could be put to good use. Uh, a lot of things, you know, I'm not naming names. It's not us versus them. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stuff that's been very similar to how it looked maybe in the 1990s. Uh, and there's lots going on since then. Like I was, uh, you know, I, a lot of new things have happened in different contexts. And so we started, I started as a controls engineer, like just like you would imagine, laptop on the garbage can lid, writing ladder logic, doing, you know, that was, that was where I, that's where I come from. That's who I am. Uh, but also I started out in the Bay Area where we're sitting around and there's like gigantic companies building all these amazing new technologies. I'm sitting around like, why don't we use some of this stuff over here in automation? Like there's a lot of benefits. I see what these amazing engineers are doing. I see all the capital and technology and investment that's going on in all these places. And that stuff is totally applicable over here in machines and robotics. Let's take some of that gear from over there. Let's take some of those techniques from over there and bring it to over here. So that's, that's really what revolution means to us. It's about yeah. really thinking about new possibilities. How can we reinvent this? Like, let's try this. And if it works, it's going to be really valuable. Um, Revolution is the one word that kind of encapsulates all of that for us. Well, I'm excited to get into to more of what you do and kind of, let's say, the creative side. I sure. know that's going to be a big part of our conversation today. When someone, you know, when, when someone asks you what Loop does, right, because I was looking at it, it's like, okay, I know you're a distributor. I know you do systems integration and automation projects. Like, what's the easiest way to describe it to someone so they know who you are? Yeah, totally. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're fitting us into things that you've seen before, I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're totally a weird mm -hmm. company, so that's what we identify with primarily, but... Perfect. Uh, you're from Portland. Right? We're Portland. We keep it weird. <laughs> we like doing weird stuff that makes no sense, apparently no sense, but yeah. apparently there's a lot of smart people that work here, and mm -hmm. somehow we pay the bills and keeps the lights on. Uh, we, do, we are a distributor. We, we sell a lot of a lot of components a lot of controls components things like plcs industrial computers robots uh, we sell these things because we have relationships and we design them into new applications uh, we get paid like distributors get paid on that basis so mm -hmm. we also do a ton of systems integration and really in systems integration it means a lot of different things like we're primarily coders so we're, mm -hmm. we're writing software writing software for those controllers we're helping people do new processes we're helping kind of tailor or adapt uh, in these new context creative contexts where a lot of the work that we're doing looks like software engineering or it looks yeah. like plc code development um, we got a big team of people that's maybe you know there's 15 people that are doing that with primarily full-time just like hands-on keyboard uh, making new software and new things for machines what's your story that got you into robotics engineering in general and then yeah. and then we'll get to the loop portion of the story yeah i mean i grew up playing video games and i remember distinctly when my mom came in she was so sick of me playing video games all the time but she tapped me on the shoulder and she was like what are you doing right now and and i was like oh i'm i'm making new levels for quake mm-hmm and she's looking at this 15-year-old kid who's basically sitting in front of architectural software designing <laughs> world, new worlds for video games. And she's like, yeah. okay, you'll be fine. Yeah. So, like, I was into that. I was into software. I was into making things. Um, but really, when I started getting involved in controls at University of Illinois, it was, it was the experience of, okay, here's your software. Here's this code that you've, that you've written. Here's mm -hmm. this digital system that you built. But when you hit enter things are going to happen in the real world, right? And that was, like, really what was addictive to me. It was, like, when I hit enter, this robot is going to, like, go screaming down this corridor or, like, something physical is going to happen. Like, that was what was super exciting to me. That's what really hooked me, that, like, software in the physical world. Like, that's how I really got into controls and really getting hooked up with a company that was doing automation component distribution, so, like, motion control and these other kind of things. That was really what was I was excited about. Yeah. And that got me into PLC programming. It got me into motion control and... And really, like, everything we've been working on since then kind of comes from that initial, like, 
entry into that via that way, which is like, this is just so fun to write code that does things in the real world. So we're up here in the Pacific Northwest, but Loop originated down in San Francisco. Yep. Tell us how Loop yep. came to be. Yeah, so I mentioned I was working for a, what 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 we would call a high-tech automation distributor. So we mm-hmm. sold things like, you know, linear guides and gearboxes, motion controllers, servo drive, like all that kind of all that kind of gear for machines. And of course we were like, it's a super technical job. I was an application engineer. And it was like, go make it work was basically my job. So um, it would be different kinds of machines for woodworking or in semiconductor, just like whatever that we were working on. Like it was my job to go make it work. And eventually I started doing PowerPoint presentations and then I accidentally became a salesperson. Um, And then I was, you know, pitching these new concepts to customers about really just on the basis of like so passionate about the technology. That was why people would work with us. It wasn't because we were established or it wasn't because, you know, it's like I was 27 years old in an ill-fitting suit. Like they weren't <laughs> picking, it, it wasn't because of the image. It was because clearly uh, we were excited about what we were talking about and, and they, they believed in us enough to be like, yeah, these, these people seem really enthusiastic and excited. We should give them a chance. And that, like, that's, that's where all our opportunities came from. And it still kind of works that way today. Enthusiasm over mediocre tailoring it was, not a, <laughs> was not a theme on Manufacturing right. Happy Hour no. up until today. No, there were no gray beards at the time, <laughs> just, just clean faces and, and, and a lot, of, lot, of, lot more baby fat. But yeah, no, that was, it, was, it was a different look at that time. Well, I want to add, I have another question on this topic because you weren't always called Loop. And right. for the listeners out there, Loop is spelled L-O-U-P-E. For, loop. for context. Yes, loop. like control loop. Yes, close. Close to close. control loop, close. yes, but certainly brings up those those images. But why, what was your name? Tell, tell everyone what the name was before. Okay, <laughs> get ready for the 11 to 13 syllables. It was Automation Resources Group. What a name. And when you're trying to appear established and boring, because on purpose, that's what you name your company when you're 25 or 27 years old and um it served us well Mm -hmm. uh you can find a lot of content on our website about why we burnt that name to the ground and we thank it for its service but it you know give us the short give us us the short story on that why did you change the name when when we're talking about about passion and creativity and really being like deep into the technology and excited about it automation resources group does not reflect that energy it doesn't sure. reflect that core idea and loop um being you know if you compare it to a lot of names that are in the automation industry that are usually they're somebody's name like mm-hmm. the founder's name from 100 years ago or 150 mm-hmm. years ago you've mm-hmm. got you know i don't need to name them they're most they're mostly that way they're super functional loop is a really fun and and figurative name about you know it's like it's it's punchy as a single syllable like it really it's really distinctive in that way in the way in the way that we want to be distinctive um and loop is also a small magnifying glass which i really love it's just this tool that you use to like look really closely at something Mm -hmm. so it has all these different meanings um it's easy to say although people do mispronounce it it's not lupe by the way it's (laughs) loop um but um it's really punchy and it's distinctive and and it's, it's it's a much better expression of that core idea and core purpose of our company than something that has 13 syllables. Do you feel it's helped? I'm curious in the different facets where you feel, feel does, does it give you more pride in the company? Does it give the team more pride in the company? Does it, do, does it resonate more with customers? I'm curious what you feel like the, the holistic impact of that might be, largely so people can learn who might be married to a brand that they have. Oh, like, totally. Gosh, there's totally. something we could be doing better. What we're talking about is the feeling of alignment, right? Mm-hmm. Like when we were Automation Resources Group, we were having to overcome all of this, you couldn't see it from the outside. If you just if you just got a glance at Automation Resources Group or God forbid our website at the time, or you mm-hmm. heard that, or I cold called you and said that on the phone, <laughs> like you're like who, what, no, like it, 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 you're you're having even though we still had that same passion, we were same people, same ideas going behind the company, like we were having to overcome that all the time, mm-hmm. right? Like we were having to like, it was just sort of like walking around with cement shoes because it's just like uh now when we talk about loop it's total it's it's aligned it makes sense like it and when and when not just the name but also the brand and the thought behind it if you just get a glance at it you do have the fe- you know i feel like or people tell me or like i really appreciate it, like it is distinctive it's like you can get a glance at you're like oh this is something u- interesting unique creative weird like it does reflect all those ideas like all that brand strategy that went in behind that and that's just so freeing to and, and it makes us better at doing that right mm-hmm. like when we're like we're loop we're creative but we're loop this is what we do we're this is what we're about um it's much easier to be that you can be it more intensely it makes you better at being that so like it's just it all fits together 
uh, in a really powerful way. And then, then people that see that, whether that's an employee or whether that's a potential new client, they're attracted to the company or they, they feel like aligned to that company. Like they're like, I see what you're doing and I want to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's your sales process. You're like, cool. So what are we doing? Right. Like, or not, yeah, now you work here. Like, because there's already that feeling of alignment. It's clear what it's about, right? Like that's what a brand is. Like there should be clarity about what it's about. You don't have to have a brand that's loop. Like loop has specific meaning, but like, you know, I, I like to say too, like, people know what Goldman Sachs is. Goldman Sachs is a brand. If you are a bloodthirsty person, you know, you're bloodthirsty <laughs> capitalist, go work for Goldman Sachs. Like they have that brand, right? And I respect yeah. them for having that brand. I don't love what they do, but their brand is amazing mm-hmm. for who they are, right? Mm-hmm. Like it works for them. So, um, you know, whatever your brand is, like it should be reflective of those values. It should be reflective of what you're about. People should know it like instantly right away. So um, I do feel like it has that benefit for us. It's really served us well in that way. Let's talk a bit more about your brand because we are here in your shop in Southeast Portland, Oregon. Yes. Right. And for the people that can't see this, I, you you have a big social media presence. But let's paint the picture a little bit. We're in we're in front of a couple big robots that you describe as your showroom as well. Showroom bots. What, and and what are some of the things are painted on the wall here? Right. This is very much like a co working space. Co working space. Of some of the mural, it sort of looks like here. a cool advertising agency, but it's also got 400 volt power, which yeah. is not easy to find. You have to build it from scratch yourself. <laughs> is what I learned. Uh, but what you when you look at the mural, like these are the these are the core values of our company, mm-hmm. and you know along with all those brand message, all those brand ideas, a lot of the core. You know you'll hear about core values. Almost everybody has core values, whether they're written or not. Mm -hmm. And just because you have posters on the wall that say integrity, like doesn't mean you're really doing it, right? Like it's like, do these inform the behaviors of the company? And like, is this really how you act? Are these really the rules? Uh, We've thought really intensely about that. Mm -hmm. And so, and we also got a lot of professional help sort Mm -hmm. of like pulling that out of all the intuitive stuff we were doing previously. And so these words and these, these ideas represent the core values of loop. We, um, and when we moved into the space, which is sort of this like really bright white box full of gear everywhere and tools and, Mm -hmm. you know, half built creative projects and art projects. Um, I asked, I saw a mural around Portland from Zach Yarrington. I just cold emailed him. I was like, Hey, I've got this space. I've got these ideas. I've got these core values. Can you, can you fill this 70 foot wall with a mural from these words? And at first he was like, well, that seems like a lot of words. <laughs> and I was yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. But you know, there's seven core values. It's 70 feet long and 10 feet tall. He did these amazing 10 by 10 icons mm-hmm. uh, that represent those ideas. And now, if you go onto our company Slack, there's little emoji stickers of like minimum viable bureaucracy, engineer mm-hmm. your lifestyle, no assholes. Like these are the rules that we live by, and we see that it again just reminding of people. It's like encouraging of people. It's it's when people are doing that, you can see it right away. If you're acting like an asshole in front of a giant sign that says no assholes, it's really <laughs> obvious. So it's hard to it's hard to go against that. It's it's very encouraging of good behavior. I would say. Sorry for the language. No, no, no. It's okay. We can we can just hit that explicit button on this episode. No, I knew we were gonna go there. I it know what that one says. It's mutual it's, respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think no assholes and engineer your lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle for sure. are my two favorites okay, out of cool. out of Thank the. Seven that are on the wall. So, uh-huh. you know, we paint. We've painted the picture, pun intended, um, mm-hmm. of the mural itself. But also, we were talking when I came here and I was taking a little tour, right? And I was asking, "Hey, who's who's you know who's the client for these robots, right? Yeah. Who, are you, who are you building these for?" You're like, actually. This is like a showroom. Describe yeah. how that, because that's, I think, a very unique aspect to yeah. have a very expensive industrial robot here right. that's not part of a project that you're trying to ship out the door later on. Right, that's right. And and the reason, I mean, back to core purpose, back mm-hmm. to passion, back to what do, what do we want to be a part of, what do we want our work to be like? I want to come to a Skunk Works workshop and work on badass secret projects all the time with mm-hmm. the coolest gear possible to create new things, to create amazing things. Like that's what I'm really passionate about doing. And some, like a lot of work in automation is like that. Some work in automation is not like that. And that's okay, right? Like go build, go build another, build a bottling line as efficiently as possible. Like, hell yeah. I'm sure there's awesome and creative things about that. Yeah. We like want to work on that really experimental stuff where like, it's not clear if it's going to work. Uh, but if it does work, there's going to be a huge payoff. And so we want to have this kind of workshop kind of magical space where anything could happen, like mm-hmm. this kind of like creative space where new things are possible. Um, and so having the right gear on hand and working with these robots, uh, I mean, we scaled up to the biggest one now that ABB has. Mm-hmm. Like this wasn't our first robot, but yeah. we found that when we would bring robots in here and it was it was something that we could experiment with, it was something that we'd be like, well, just try it. 
just mm-hmm. try it. You know, we'd be talk, 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 a bunch of people arguing in a meeting. Yeah. I'd be like, you know what we could do is we could just put the chainsaw onto the robot and see what happens. And, oh, that answers the question with no yeah. ambiguity. Like, just go try it. Like, yeah. you learn so much from doing and experimenting with things that that's really the space that we wanted to build. And it's really, we directly do that here. This is our workshop. Mm-hmm. And so we want to have those, you know, we want to have those kinds of gear. We want to have that kind of, those kind of robots on hand. And, you know, when we're done with it, I'm sure we'll sell it off to somebody who will get good use out of it. So, sure. yeah, we had to capitalize it, but, you know, it's not something that, that that's kind of what we this is the kind of place that we want to have to work with this is where mm-hmm. people want to come work with it we want to make videos of it we want to show it off and talk about the the kind of fun we have with doing it and i do want to build a giant tyrannosaurus rex head for this <laughs> because it does have that fitting. it does have that it has appearance that, it has that vibe. yeah it looks like a dinosaur if we're looking yeah. at it the right way yeah it does it uh, does <laughs> i um i have to ask so first of all um there is a video of that robot chainsaw video yes uh, they're correct okay i will link up to that in the show notes my question is the biggest question of this conversation. And, and when you and I were having lunch trying to figure out, hey, what, what do we think the theme of this discussion is? Yeah. You said a few simple words and you said, hey, the economics of creativity. Right. Right. Like you're, you're running a very unique business here. You talk about, hey, you're not doing that bottling line per se. You're trying to hit some home runs. Tell yeah. me how this works and how, how, you know, tell the audience sure. how it works as well. Sure. I mean, um, the simple. The concept of it is, um, it's kind of simple, but it's not, it's often not thought about it in these terms. Like, um, basically it's like there, are, we know, or we have the feeling or the intuition that there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of new technology just laying around that that's really powerful mm-hmm. that hasn't made it into our industry yet. Um, and we see it being used in powerful ways in other places. And we're like, we could do that over here. Um, and so what we're doing really is taking these parts or ideas from different industries and bringing them into automation. Now, what that means is you're doing things that have never been done before, maybe, I mean, Mm -hmm. often, or you're like, let's take these three pieces and put them together in a new way. What you're like, that's a very risky thing to do because a lot of times you do something new, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, But also sometimes when you do new things, it unlocks tremendous value. Like it's not just an efficiency kind of value. It's like this is 10 times better or a hundred times better than what came before it. Mm -hmm. And that unlocks just like incredible, you know, discovering a new way of doing something is really, really valuable. And so if you're taking these little bets, you're like, and again, at any scale, right? If that's in, a, in an individual, if it's, a, you know, we have, we work with Boeing, we have supplier words from Boeing, their budgets are very different for experimental bets. They're very high mm-hmm. because they're very big payouts, right? Like again, coming from the Bay Area, seeing these companies take these bets at things that are, you know, these gigantic markets. Basically, if you're betting $1,000, but you could, you know, your outcome could be $10,000 or $100,000, you can keep doing that. Yeah. And you can be wrong most of the time. Or you can be like, yeah. that was a good shot. It was worthwhile. It didn't work out. Okay, you lost a thousand bucks. But if but when they hit, they're tremendously valuable. And you can keep being wrong all the time and survive. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. and so like it's not as if we're you know, it's different than you're saying, look, we're running at a hundred percent, we got five percent loss, we're trying to get to four percent loss. But look, in that scenario, if you screw it up. Like you're twenty x down, right? Like you yeah. could, you could, if you take down production of hundred, you're, the losses are are tremendous. There's and there's only a one percent upside, mm-hmm. right? And so we're like thinking about creativity is really about making these like asymmetric bets. Like if we try this, if it works, there's a big payoff. If it doesn't work, it's not that expensive, right? Like yeah. it's not that expensive compared to the payout. So really. Sure whether that's with our clients or whether that's with our own work, we're like, let's dabble, let's try these, let's make, obviously we're not trying to be wasteful, we're trying to make good decisions, but like the point is you don't have to be mm-hmm. right that often to grow and be successful if you are occasionally putting some of these home runs over the fence, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't have to happen that often to, to keep doing it and it's, and it's really fun. It's risky, mm-hmm. it's a different kind of work because um, often you're like, when is any when is anything ever going to work but it's mm-hmm. it's a very it's a very different risk reward profile uh, and we, and we like to do that kind of work and and being so distinctive and so much about like this is what we do like we're here for revolution we're here to revolutionize things yeah. like clients that have that mentality employees that have that mentality like different kinds of companies or different suppliers that they that that relate to that like those are our people those are who we want to work with it's not mm-hmm. everybody but like it's very clear that that's what we do here and it goes even into things like contract structures it's like our contract structures or engagements are very structured around being small and experimental mm-hmm. it's not 
it's not a seven or eight figure fixed bid project that's going to land on July 1st. It's like, right. let's build it a bit at a time. And if we find that we were wrong, just stop, right? Just yeah. stop. Yeah. It was a worthwhile bet, but hey, like it didn't work out. Or like, let's double down and let's do it harder. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Like it, it goes that deep into the economics of the company. Like mm-hmm. how do we make our contract structures support that creativity? So um, I could talk for a lot more time about it, but it does well, work. I, I have some pointed questions around it. Why, why are you like the only company like this, right? Why aren't we seeing this type of approach elsewhere in the automation and manufacturing world? There are some people out there. In fact, okay. when we started to really go hard at this uh, and really let, you know, we, we used to think, well, any anybody, any, any project with a pulse will take because mm-hmm. that's what you do. We started, I, it was scary to say, we're only going to do this. Yeah. Because you're like, well, there's no customers for that, right? To your point, where mm-hmm. is everybody that wants to do that? Mm-hmm. Um, there are people and customers that see things that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're starting to find them. We're starting to get better at them. Back to that brand messaging. It's like, this is what we're about. Yeah. Um, whoever, and, and, and I really came to be at peace with whatever size that company is, however many clients there are out there that appreciate that, like that's how big we'll be. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that, right? Because that's the kind of work I want to do. Um, I think there are companies that have that aggre- that that kind of like budget, aggression, vision and like th- it's not every company, right? Like and mm-hmm. there's companies there's companies that I think are really known for that. Like you you know, you look at like Elon Musk companies, you look at like you look at like a Tesla, like they're very revolutionary and they're like we're not we're not tied down to any way that this was previously done. We think there's a new approach to this that could be significantly better. They take that approach in their manufacturing operations. You, you look at what they're doing with their battery factories and stuff like that. Like that stuff has never been seen before. Mm-hmm. They're willing to take those kind of bets because they see the upside. And they're like, well, we'll just keep trying it until it works because like, look, you know, we're going to revolutionize, you know, we're going to convert this to the clean energy economy. It's like there are companies that have that kind of mentality or that can make a legitimate business case that's like, if this is a $20 million program, we could turn this into a billion dollar business. Like, mm-hmm. and there are companies and there are places where that gets greenlit. It's not everywhere, you know, but again, it's not just big companies. It's also like at the individual level, it's like I could invest a thousand dollars in my own education and I can, I could go and get a better job. Like it's that, that's the kind of asymmetry that you can see in just like trying or learning new things. Um, and so, no, I, it's not for everybody, but I think there's like so many opportunities about out there for, to do that. And, Whoever's interested, like, let's work together. That's my attitude about it. Do you think creativity needs to be emphasized more in the automation world than it is? I think creativity and also the risk modeling that I'm talking Mm -hmm. about, right? Like, a lot of people are afraid to take chances because they're looking at it at a very, like, operational efficiency kind of mindset or an ROI mindset, Mm -hmm. which oftentimes now when I hear that word, it almost, like, scares me because it's, like, what's the upside like what's the upside like especially when those things are new like a lot of the upside to exploration it can't be seen Mm -hmm. at that point Mm because you have to go and learn right and so um any time where there's that like like basically i just think there should be a lot more appetite for risk right like and and because it's because it makes economic sense right Mm -hmm. it's not like it's not like um i'm uh, I'm saying we should be wasteful. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's like, comp- you know, or companies like Amazon or companies where they're like, they're going to go and figure out how to do this in a new way because it's going to benefit their company. Um, they see the upside of doing that, right? They see the upside of being on the other side of that change and they they want to they want to lead it. So companies that have that mentality or individuals that have that mentality, like that's that's who we want to work with. And yeah, we we know that when we go out and try things and we explore, like we find valuable things. Like we, we, we know that that's possible. Uh, and that's what we, that's what we want to do all the time. What's one of your, we'll call it creative endeavors, maybe a success story, whatever we want to call it, that, that you're most proud of? That I'm most proud of. That you can share as well. I'm sure not everything you can talk about. Right. I have, to think about, I have to think about it in that case. <laughs> I mean, it's, one of the things I was most pleased with was, you know, when iPads started to come out, when iPhones started to come out, when, when we're looking at a lot of what was happening with user interfaces. Mm-hmm. I'm talking in 2010, right? Yeah. Like, this is yeah. not new at this point, right? right? Like, it's 20, that was 15 years ago that this stuff mm-hmm. was coming out. Mm-hmm. And we were looking at industrial HMIs, and you put them side by side, and it's still this way, if you ask me. And you're just like, hold your iPhone next <laughs> yeah. to it, hold, look at the industrial screen, and you're like, you just, you just have this deep sigh, like, ugh. Yeah. Okay. Why is like, there this again, discrepancy? I have a ton of respect for everybody <laughs> doing that work. I've done that work. I've made those HMIs, to be clear. Yeah. Um, but when, when we were sitting here in the Bay Area, we're like, why don't we make, what, why, why don't we use some of, you know, we see this crew, these crews over here making amazing interfaces with HTML, with CSS, mm-hmm. with JavaScript. Mm-hmm. They're investing billions of dollars in tooling of this. Like, what? I'd rather build 
a user interface with HTML and CSS than with some of these, you know, some of these like pushing the pixels around. Yeah. Because I don't want to sit here for a week and push the pixels around. Like I was pushing the pixels around. I didn't want to do that anymore. Right. So it's like, there's a, like, I noticed there's like cooler ways to do this that I'm excited to work with. And so we started building, we started building adapters. We started building writing software so that we could make industrial user interfaces with web technology. And mm-hmm. th- I'm talking, this is 10 years ago, right? Um, we're not the only people that talk about that now. There's, there's other folks that have done that in the meantime, but it's like th- we were, we were doing that stuff and building that stuff in 2010. And now it's just like, of course, of course, that's what we use. Like, it's just yeah. like a part of our practice and everything. And now when we're, we look at, look at other ways of doing it, we're like, oh no, not going, no way we're going back to that. Like we're not yeah. going back to the old way. Uh, because, because, <clears throat> because of how powerful it is, you know? And, and, it, and at that point it's like taken for granted, right? Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like, yeah, of course we do it that way. Um, but I mean, reflecting on it, thinking about it, that's, that's one of the ones that comes to mind for sure. That was like, yeah, that was, that was an obvious one, mm-hmm. right? Like there's, there's amazing companies. This is amazing technology for building user interfaces. Like let's try to do it over here in industrial automation world. Like yeah. we can totally do that. There's another element to your company's creativity. And that's what we all see on social media. Mm-hmm. You know, if anyone out there isn't following loop yet on, on LinkedIn, you know, make loop. sure you're doing that. Um, what is it? Robo Corio. Robo Corio on TikTok. Yeah. That's right. Follow my LinkedIn account, David Nichols on LinkedIn. That's me. We started posting all our stuff on, on my account because it works better. It's all a of those will, for all you. All of those folks. will be in the show notes for those of you link listening. It up. So I'll I'll Follow, have please. I'll have that link at the end of the episode for everyone. But how has that helped your business as well? Like and for context, describe the type of videos you create as well. Yeah, I mean I'm talking, it all goes back to that brand messaging stuff, which mm-hmm. is just like, what is the idea of this company? Yeah. We're passionate. We're excited about that technology. We like what we're working with. We do interesting experiments. We've got a secret lab. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Just turn on a video camera and point it at something interesting that we're literally laughing about maniacally. Yeah. We're like, mm-hmm. we're like <laughs> a chainsaw on a robot. <laughs> like that was a real thing. I like it wasn't that's just been the, a stunt. Like, running example in this episode. <laughs> a dancing <laughs> robot dog. Like how cool is that? Like it's yeah. just, or, you know, just like we're controlling with video game controllers. Like this is stuff that we're interested in and passionate about. When that's real, you can just turn on your iPhone for st- and record for 30 seconds and you have an amazing video that's true. It shows yeah. something interesting. Mm-hmm. It's awesome technology. It's mm-hmm. just like it doesn't get any better than that like in, in 2022. And so we just build it. And I contrast this to what I used to do or what I thought I was supposed to do 10 years ago, which is like, you better dial for dollars. You better hit the curbs. Like you better go Mm -hmm. and carry your brochures to the office park and go do that. And like, I've done that. I've been, I've been okay at it. Actually, I wasn't that great at it, which, Mm -hmm. which is probably why I like making videos instead. (laughs) But it was like, that was how we reached people. And now it's like, well, I can reach a lot more people in Mm -hmm. a much truer and authentic way by just showing up on LinkedIn or showing up on TikTok and just being like, this is what we're about. This is what we're excited. If you're excited about this too, like, let's talk sometime, you know, and it's a way for people to build a relationship with you and your company without you having to call them on the phone and they don't know who you yeah. are, you know, like, and yeah. yeah, when, now when we call people on their phone, they're like, oh yeah, didn't you make those videos about the boxes? It's like, yeah, right. Cool. Yeah. You've yeah. seen our stuff. Yeah. Lots and of so, unboxing videos. Lots of unboxing yeah, those videos. Those are great. It's really fun. People, people get in or into it. And yeah, I'm not trying to take an hour of their time to go to coffee. They can see a video in 60 seconds and be like, that looks cool. Um, and you know, they'll, they'll get to know us or they'll, you know, the right kind of people will see us and, and kind of be drawn in over time. Like it's mm-hmm. not just one video we're putting out, we're putting out stuff all the time. So, you know, there'll be people that are see, see our videos now and they might not talk to us for another two years. Like, sure. That's fine. Yeah. They'll talk to us when they're Where ready. they are in the buying cycle. Right. right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. And, and we're, we're, we're reaching those people now. And again, a lot of it's, this is an augmenting, you know, still love to go to shows, still love to meet people face to face. Like there's, there's still a role for all of that. But when you can reach people all over the world by putting interesting content out on, on LinkedIn or on any of these platforms, like it's really powerful. You know, it's really taken our company from really a regional company being in the Northwest and Northern California to being like, we're reaching people all over the world. And that's really exciting. It's really exciting for the future of the company. And to confirm, like you've, you've gotten like, App, you know, pretty interesting applications as a result of putting these videos out there, oh, right? Like, oh, for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. And if you contrast it to, you know, pe- because people can see what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. And they're, they're like major name clients who we, you know, and again, don't ever, don't ever count, you know, we work with ABB Robotics. We've mm-hmm. got great referrals and relationships to ABB Robotics. They're yeah. in a, you know, we're still getting this like, you need to talk to Loop. Mm-hmm. You know, we're still, referrals and, you know, individual relationships are still super important, maybe just as important. But now when someone says, you need to talk to Loop, and they're like, "What's Loop?" 
There's a they're whole sh- base at work there. They're showing up here at our space with like nine people on the yeah. first meeting. I'm saying yeah. it's like I didn't know there was gonna be nine of you here. Like they came we just, to us. We just wanted to see the place. Right. Yeah. They're like, we wanted to see what you're up to. It looked really cool. I was like, wow, okay. Like, yeah, great. I'm so glad you're here. Like, those same people are people who are were behind a door that I was like pounding on like yeah. ten years ago. Right. Yeah. And now they're like coming to our space because they can see what we're about, right? Like, and again, it it they're any company like that can ex- express what they're about, like that that is attracting those right kind of customers because of their brand, because of mm-hmm. what they're putting out on social media, like that's really powerful. It doesn't, you, you know, you don't have to be like Loop, but like there's a lot of opportunity for people if they're really into what they're doing to put that out there, and and that's what happens. You know, people are like they get it, you know, they get it and they show up, um, and then we went on to great do great work together. So that's that's exciting. It works. Yeah, as as a longtime sales guy, I can certainly relate to the story of, hey, putting the content out so I didn't have to bang on the door, yeah, pick up right. the phone anymore, get people to come to you. Um, just a couple questions left, because we, we haven't talked about Spot, Boston Dynamics, <laughs> infamous robot Spot. dog a lot yet. Yes. I was asking you what applications you've done with them, and there was one application that you mentioned that really stuck out completely outside the realm <laughs> of what a typical appli- uh, like automation company does. Can you tell yeah. us a bit about that? Uh, sure. I think I know the one that you're talking yeah. about. Um, well, and it it's interesting how we came about it. So we, we were doing automation work with a company that did a lot in entertainment. Mm-hmm. At the, and we were doing motion control work with them. They were We were doing work where we were helping them write software mm-hmm. bec- for projects where they were using a lot of automation components, even though they're primarily like theater production, entertainment kind of stuff. And one day they called us up and they said, hey, um, we're friends with Katy Perry's people and she wants to have spot in her music video yeah and it's in 12 days and (laughs) they're like we can't help them can you help them and and i had to repeat back i was like so katie perry wants our help for her music video (laughs) is that what you just said to me yeah yeah i think we'll we'll we're in we'll take we're in yeah and uh me and like our services lead wrote up wrote up like an eight bullet point proposal and we're like I guess this is what we charge for music video work <laughs> and just emailed it off. And then, yeah, we were in LA, uh, 10 days later. So that was really amazing. Um, and it was because, you know, I think, I think all that stuff came together, right? Where it's mm-hmm. exciting new technology, you know, Katy Perry's hip to things. She's like out there. Sure. You know, what's, what's interesting out there. She, she had the same interest in us and it, it kind of makes sense intuitively. Right. Mm-hmm. And so to, to be brought into something like that, it does kind of make sense and gives us a lot more, it's a lot, a lot of validation that like that, that's interesting to people. There's something going on there that we're exploring that's valuable and important. And then, yeah. And then Katy Perry walks up and she's like, hi, I'm Katy. I'm like, Hi, I'm David. <laughs> you're Katy Perry. Like so. Anyway, that was you're pretty both, sweet. You're both regular people. No, right, right. One, right. Of, I was one like, of you is just right. on. Yeah, I mean, you're both on camera a lot. One of you you're probably just, Katie. just uh, yeah. Right. Hi. <laughs> Actually, I knew your name. Anyway, um, yeah. And I don't remember what happened after that because it was all a blur. Sure. Um, but yeah, course. it was super fun, and yeah, it was like it was also like high stakes, and it was like there were moments where like we were for sure not. It was for sure not going to work, and you know, like. Just being in that moment is really exciting. And, yeah, we, we did something we were really proud of and we thought was really cool and it was like a story to tell forever. So, yeah, I don't I don't know that that will ever happen again, but, you know, it <laughs> definitely told me that we were on the right track kind of doing what we're doing. One uh, one last question, bit a bit of advice from you. I, I want to kind of hear your story again about this, right? You know, you talked, I think it was in this interview, right? You mentioned that, hey, you realized, you know, there's a, a way people kind of expected you to do things, but then you kind of started yeah. doing things your own way. When, when did you start doing that and really – what it seems like it seems like that changed the course of your career really well i think in retrospect a lot of like what's driving the company now is there the whole time Mm -hmm. and when we were just sort of doing things intuitively and not thinking about it too much like that was still what what was working that was Mm -hmm. what was special and important about our company like it it, that that thread has been there but then we would do all of these kind of things you're supposed to do Mm -hmm. and by that I just mean I I don't know what I would pick but just basically like I was you know the way that I would dress the kind of the way that we would go to market like Mm -hmm. all these kind of like things that were like very seen as the conventional wisdom and I wish I could say that I was just like I'm such a smart ass I wish I could say that I was so smart that I just didn't do any of that ever but like I tried really hard to do that and it didn't work for me you Mm -hmm. know like I I was bashing stuff down like I was like really trying hard in a very conventional way and I was just like it's not working for us there's Mm -hmm. you know like it's not connecting you know and and there were moments where I was just like we're dead like we're never gonna make it through this like we failed to do this we've been trying too hard for two years we're just like exhausted right like and just came to this point where like well I 
I don't know what to do. I just physically can't do that anymore because it's, it's, you know, it's too stressful. It's too, you know, it's like, I'm super determined, but like, I, that, that's all I've got. Right. And so it was just sort of like laying down and dying. And then it was, then it was interesting because it was like, oh, I'm free to do whatever now because I've got nothing to lose. Right. I already yeah. tried that way. Mm-hmm. Didn't work for me, mm-hmm. you know, and, or I just hit a wall enough times. Like if you can make it work that way, I wouldn't knock it. Like, actually it seems to make sense for a lot of people, but like it didn't work for me. And so when, when I, that was when we were really free to do stuff that was like, I think this is cool. I'm going to do it. I think this is cool. I'm going to do it. And then like, that was just the start of that cycle. Like that freedom of being like, I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, it really let us be like really out there and really expressive in that way. That was real. Mm -hmm. It was truthful. And like, I'm having a blast Mm -hmm. and I'm doing great work and we're having a blast and doing great work. Like, other employees show up like great clients show up like that's the kind of space you want to be in right and be that's engagement right that's like full engagement in your work that's really powerful right it's really powerful economically it's really powerful it feels good you know like and that that was like what really you know there was that pivot in the company where it was just like let's just do it that way and we've been really rewarded we've grown a ton a lot we've grown a ton from taking that kind of approach and so I wish I had done it sooner. I wish more, I wish more people would hear if they're starting out, like, just go with, go with, you know, go with what's inside your heart, go with what's in your gut. You know, that, that, that kind of, even if it's even, or especially if it's against conventional wisdom, like there's mm-hmm. something remarkable there that people are going to appreciate, you know, if you can really, if you can really own it, if you can really be it, do it, go do it, you know? So again, easy for me to say I had a company for a while, but I, I, I wish I had done it sooner uh, because, because uh, it, it works. No, it's super pragmatic advice to to wrap the interview with. You know, it's been a blast hanging out with you today, David. Thank you so much for the, coming. Uh, yeah, there's more to Della sandwiches to <laughs> finishing the podcast here now. Is there anything you wish I would have asked you that we didn't cover? Oh, oh man, so many things. No, I just want to talk about creativity some more. Let's go drill some holes in some where, things. Where, and do where some should stuff we go? To, no where, where would be the spot to grab a beer after this? It's manufacturing oh, happy oh, hour. Oh, we didn't, oh, we, like, okay. We're in Portland. So we got I was give wondering a when you came here. <laughs> if you walk, if you if you go out this door and you turn left to the end of the hallway, <laughs> there's a brewery called Ruse. That's that's like been one of the best breweries in Oregon from the I don't know oh, what really? newspaper. No, I think I think that's where we're headed next. So we should we should wrap up so we can go get go get go get some samples. Go see them. Love Ruse, it. Ruse in Love our it. building. Well, hey, fireman. I will have links to connect with Loop, with David in the show notes. Thanks for sticking around for today's interview. Thank you so much. Great to have you, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thanks Thanks for the hospitality. Catch you soon.